Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to Starting Point and Starting Point Online. I'm so glad to just study God's Word with you, and uh, this is just a safe place uh, for those who have been in the Lord or maybe are new to the Lord to ask questions and get good answers. Um, if you go on our Facebook page, you will find the handout in all of our curriculum um, in one of our files uh, under the Starting Point post, and uh, feel free to uh, follow along through those notes. Uh, and uh, as we get going here, why don't we just ask God uh, to be with us and bless us. I invite you to pray with me. Heavenly Father, you promised wherever two or three are gathered, you show up in such a powerful way. And I know this is a different type of gathering, and yet we know you are here. Please bring your Holy Spirit to give us eyes to see the beauty of Jesus, hearts to hold him, and hands and feet that want to live out his directives. In Jesus' name, amen. And so again, welcome to Starting Point. Uh, tonight we're going to talk about Lesson 2, What Makes the Bible So Special? And before we get into it, I just want to go through the ground rules of our class, okay? Uh, so here are the guidelines. First of all, have fun. Uh, this means you can chat online, uh, join in with any discussion we're having, and hopefully this is just an insightful time for you to get to know the best of the Bible. There are no bad questions. And so at any time, if you want to ask a question in the chat box, feel free on anything spiritual. This is that fun and safe environment to do so. And we just love talking about those things. Uh, ask whenever you want to. Obviously, you can get up whenever you want to because well, you're at home. Uh, so make yourself comfortable. Maybe you even have this just on in the background as you're doing something. Uh, that's just fine. And there is eating. Maybe it's even supper time at your household. Uh, that's wonderful. Uh, welcome to COVID-19 type of learning. Uh, just glad that you've joined us. But I wanted to get uh, maybe a discussion going for those who have joined us. And I wanted to ask you, what is a place you'd like to travel to when this is over? Now, in our household, it's a very easy answer if I'd ask my daughter this. And my daughter's actually in the audience tonight. Hi, Bella. Uh, that answer for Bella is the Ukraine. And the reason being is because this past year, uh, my daughter and I went on a mission journey, and we got connected to such wonderful people in the Ukraine. We went there to show them love and encourage them, and they outloved us on every level. Uh, they were just so gracious, and uh, now my daughter has made uh, some friends forever that she follows on Instagram, um, and uh, it's just a pretty cool thing. Uh, so if you're uh, on the chat box, is there any place you'd like to travel, uh, just type it in and uh, would love to get to know you and, and where you'd like to go. Uh, for my wife and I, it is our 15-year anniversary, and I don't know if it'll happen, um, but uh, would love to go to uh, Paris with my wife someday. You know, the, the, the city for romantics, and I just think that'd be an awesome, awesome deal. Uh, I saw in the chat box, this is from my other daughter, Nadia, who wants to go to the Czech Republic. Um, and that's because the other half, my wife's half of the family, uh, came from the Czech. Uh, my, my wife's maiden name was Matic or Matt Czech, um, and so they have some history there. Um, so that's just awesome. All right, well, thank you again uh, for joining us. Why don't we dive in to our discussion of God's Word? And with that, I just wanted to ask you, do you have a favorite Bible story? Out of all scripture, is there something that just pops out as one of your just very, very favorite portions? Now, for me, I, I mean, I could choose so many, right? Um, you have the resurrection on Easter. How, how can you beat the resurrection? But I love talking about when God made the sun stand still. Do you remember this account? Joshua is taking over the promised land, and they were winning as long as it was day. And so Joshua said, can we have 12 more hours of sun? And God granted it. And for 12 more hours, the sun stood still in its place. And, and you think of scientifically what that would have taken, whether God stopped the world from rotating or, or stopped the sun from going around. I, I don't know, but 12 more hours of sun so they could win that battle. You know, there are so many incredible portions of Scripture. Do you have a favorite? Feel free to, to type it in. I just want to say hey to Cheryl, uh, going to Vegas and California to visit grandchildren. Absolutely. 
Uh, how wonderful it will be when we can travel and go see our family once again. That will be absolutely fantastic. Um, so as we get into the teaching of God's Word, one of the questions we need to ask is, can we trust it? Is it reliable? You know, if you don't believe in its reliability, you may be searching and wondering for truth. In fact, I believe many people are searching because they, they don't believe it's a reliable book. They've heard from a friend or they, they thought the theory that it's been passed down so many times, you know, over history that it's been muddled and it's been, you know, mismanaged and, and, and now we don't have a reliable word. Well, we're going to talk about that. In tonight's lesson, we're, we're not only going to talk about what the Bible says about itself, we're also going to look at the academic research behind the preservation of of the Bible. Uh, something that I really looked into during my time at seminary. And I, I hope it's a beneficial thing if you've uh, never had the study of the origins of the Bible or how it was preserved. Or if you've ever had a study of the canon um, and how that came to be. Uh, so let's get into things. First of all, we're going to look at what the Bible says about itself. And um, <laughs> hi, Annette Richo, by the way. Um, <laughs> does this surprise anyone they want to go to the Czech Republic? That's awesome. Uh, great, great to see you online. Uh, what, what does the Bible say about itself? In 1 Thessalonians 2, it says this. We thank God continually because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as it actually is the word of God, which is at work in you who believe. You know, the word of men versus the word of God. Um, I consider all the reading opportunities we have right now. And a very popular series is Harry Potter. And it doesn't take much to understand that J.K. Rowling had this idea in her mind uh, to present this, this incredible story. Um, many, many books. And uh, if not for J.K. Rowling, we would have no Harry Potter. But when it comes to the Bible, this isn't just the thought of a man or a woman. Our first scripture says it's not the word of men, it is the word of God. In fact, one of the things we'll discuss is that it doesn't just have one author. Rather, it has many different authors over thousands of years that all tell the same story. In fact, when you look at the Bible, it's a compilation. So, so what that means is many books were put together, right? It's, it's not just like end and beginning, you know, like one novel of Harry Potter. You have like Harry Potter and Walt Whitman and, and all these different things coming together, but they all tell the same story. Now, how can that be? How can I tell you that this is actually the word of God? Well, Scripture also tells us how it was formed. I love 2 Timothy. It, it's where we get the teaching of verbal inspiration because it says all Scripture is God-breathed. Now, God breathed uh, in Latin means inspiro. And this reminds me of CPR. You ever taken a class like that? I was a camp counselor, and I remember trying to get the, 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 the beat right, you know, whenever you're doing the pumps and, and breathing into so that that person could be come alive once more. So, so God is saying, yes, there were humans that wrote it, but I was breathing into them so that what they wrote was actually what I wanted. I was guiding that process. In fact, in 2 Peter it says, Prophecy never had its origin in the will of men, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. How awesome is this? That God was right there for the authors of the New Testament. So that when they finally finished their work, and the Old Testament, when they finally finished their work, it was exactly what God wanted them to have. So we call this process verbal inspiration. Now, in our questions, it says that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are four Gospels written by Jesus' disciples who are eyewitnesses. And how do the four accounts help us to understand the miracle of inspiration? Now, now one thing we should just pause and recognize is how cool is it that these writers actually saw Jesus, walked with him, and even after the resurrection. So, so they have a, a written account. And it's kind of like if we would go to a ball game. Let's say the Cubs were playing. If we went to Wrigley Field and we watched them play, we would probably get the, the same score at the end of the day. You know, hopefully the Cubs won so we could sing the song. We'd probably pick up on anyone who wrote a, 
who hit a home run, anyone who had a, a great play in the field. But you might pick up on different details than I would. Based on your favorite player or my favorite player, I'd probably just write about Rizzo. I don't know about you. Uh, maybe you, you're Chris Bryant. And, and so we might have a different story, but we'd have the same score, and, and we'd have some of the same plays. And that reminds me of the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they have maybe different nuances to the story, but it's the same story. They have different perspectives. John especially talks about Holy Week. About half of his book is just about Holy Week. But it's the same story. How awesome. You know, it's different than when I was going to school. In school, we had this game called the telephone game. You had a phrase that started at one side of the classroom, and by the time it got to the other side of the classroom, you know, and people whispering in the ear, it was a completely different phrase, right? Now, some people, by the way, I think messed it up on purpose, but anyway. Um, <laughs> how great to know that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they all tell the same story, all talking about Jesus so that we can count on this word. So how would you answer the skeptic's question, how can the Bible be called God's word if human writers write it, um, or human writers wrote it? Uh, because God uh, guided the process. He again breathed into Scripture, and he was there the whole time. But perhaps what is really different about the age we live in is how people want to pick and choose certain parts. I don't know if you've come upon a Christian who wants to take and, and, and pick certain things. Like, I like the, the cross of Jesus and obviously the resurrection of Jesus. But, you know, I don't really like the creation. And I'm not really sure about the four horsemen in Revelation. So I'm going to take the cross and the resurrection. But the rest, I, I don't know. Or maybe there are some that say, you know what, I, I really like creation. And, and, and I like, uh, you know, the flood and, and, and the, the parting of the Red Sea and the cross and the resurrection. But, you know, I don't like the New Testament miracles like Jesus walking on water um, or I don't like Noah's Ark. So I'm going to take those. Well, this becomes an exercise in subjectivity. And in fact, some church bodies have done this exercise by saying the Bible contains God's word. And when you use that ambiguous language that the Bible contains God's word, you're basically saying we get to pick and choose uh, based on what we believe is true today. In fact, that's what you see in, in various church bodies. Uh, they have changing theology based on what they feel is appropriate for today. But the Bible contains God's word is a slippery slope for sure. In fact, how can we trust any of it if we're not quite sure which portions. In fact, it's better just to say the Bible is God's Word. And then we can trust it from start to end, front to middle, and uh, go from there. So we believe that when it comes to the Bible, it is entirely preserved by God. Now, uh, what, what you need to know is it's split up in different parts, the Old Testament and the New Testament. And, and another big question I get is, you know, Pastor, I, I really like the New Testament. I love the stories of Jesus. But do I even have to read the Old Testament? Like, what is it there for? It seems like God was angry and, you know, there's a lot of battles. And, and, and what is it? Well, the Old Testament, I believe, is still important. Um, and the Old Testament is one that just will point to Jesus on the cross. So the Old Testament is all about foreshadowing. In, in fact, in the Old Testament, you, you start it in Genesis where they fell, and, and God says, you know what? I'm going to send the offspring of the woman who will crush the devil's head. Now at that point, that's all the messianic message they had. Eve would have an offspring that would crush the devil's head. Foreshadowing. When Abraham comes on the scene, we hear a promise given to him. Uh, by your people, all peoples will be blessed. All peoples on earth. So now we know that the promise is that through Abraham, there will be a blessing for all people. Well, that one was passed down for a while. And then when we get to David, we have another messianic promise. That David, you're going to have a king reigning on the throne forever. And we know that's not an earthly king. This is the king of kings. Finally, when we get to Isaiah and some of the Psalms, it becomes very apparent 
who the Messiah would be. I, I think of Isaiah 53. He was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we were healed. And so in all of this, it was a great foreshadowing in, in the Old Testament. Now at seminary, we called that progressive revelation, that bit by bit, it was revealed more and more, but they all pointed to the cross of Jesus Christ. So I would love for you to read the Old Testament because it does that foreshadowing. It does speak of Jesus. What I also love about the Old Testament is that uh, you find sinners in need of a Savior. Over and over you see the rebellion of mankind and how much they needed someone to solve the problem of sin. Now in the New Testament, and, and many more Christians are familiar with the New Testament, you have something that is pointing back to the cross or centering on the cross, like the Gospels. Much of Paul's writing is, is focusing back on what Jesus has already done and the implications of the cross and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But all of it talks about Jesus. All of it is about a Messiah. And so Old Testament Christians, New Testament Christians are saved by the same faith in the Messiah. One was in the coming Messiah, one is in the Messiah that has already come. Now a question here, on which side of history would you rather be? The Old Testament wondering what this all would be, or the New Testament having figured it out? Well, I consider uh, what Peter says. Peter says about the prophecies of Jesus, even angels long to look into these things. To understand the complete revelation. And so I do love being a New Testament Christian who can see the culmination of all these things in Jesus Christ. So many prophecies fulfilled. And, and that's the era that we find ourselves in looking back at the cross of Jesus. A bit more about the Old Testament. So the language of the Old Testament is Hebrew. And this was much of my background as a pastor. Uh, so I have brought for you a Hebrew Bible. And uh, if you're familiar with books, usually you would think this is the beginning, right? Uh, this is actually the very end. Hebrew is written um, the other way of, of reading. So, so we read Hebrew uh, uh, from, left, or from right to left. And so this is actually the very beginning. If you go here, that's where you're going to find Genesis. Now, Hebrew, by the way, looks like uh, chicken dancing. Uh, that, that's what the scribbling looks like. And, and Hebrew sounds a certain way. Let me, let me read uh, Hebrew uh, uh, Genesis 1 verse 1. It sounds like this. Barashit bara Elohim et hashamayim va'et ha'eretz. Which is, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Um, and much of my seminary education was studying the Hebrew to understand the fuller context. Now, Hebrew was written between 1500 and 40, 400 B.C. Um, when you look at the very beginning of the Bible, uh, the first five books were written by Moses. And Moses tells us many interesting things like the creation of the world, and you might wonder how he does that. Well, Moses had a very unique relationship with God, by the way. He would meet with God in the tent of meeting, and they would talk face to face. So if you're wondering why he could be able to describe things that, like creation or, or times that he didn't live in, remember he had a very unique relationship with God in order to write about these things. Uh, but it was mainly the history of God's people and the promises of the Savior to come. Now, the New Testament we've talked about, written by many eyewitnesses of Jesus Christ and the resurrected Christ, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and then much of it written by Paul. Uh, it's written through a shorter time frame, about 400 to 100 A.D., and uh, it's in the language of Greek. Uh, so I brought my uh, Greek Bible here as well. Uh, again, this is much of my study. Uh, whenever I preach uh, for Sunday, I'm always doing either the Hebrew study or the Greek study um, based on the different language. Uh, this is what Greek sounds like if you're interested. Uh, John 3.16 sounds this way. Hutos gar egapadzin. Hotheos ton kosmon, hoste ton monogene edokin. So, the beginning of John 3.16, For in this way God loved the world so that he gave his only son. Now, why is that important? 
What makes the original language study so important is that instead of relying on someone else's commentary of the Bible, if you have the original languages, you can be your own commentator. And that way you won't be swayed by popular opinion or, or changing theology. You can go back to the very original, to the source, the source of the source, and understand what God is saying. So it is a wonderful gift to understand both Greek and Hebrew and give the fuller nuance of the word. Now with that, let's get into the major teachings of the Bible. And really you can split up the major teachings of the Bible as law and gospel. Law and gospel. Now what the law will say is what you are to do or not do, like the Ten Commandments, and what you deserve if you break the commands. Um, so the law is seen in Romans 6.23, like the wages of sin is death. This is law. And, and the law has a way of, well, terrifying. Th this is a hard word. If all the Bible contained was the law, we, we would have a very scary God. But the law exposes our need. One of the great things about the law is it says we need a Savior. And so that when the gospel comes in after exposing our need, the gospel is so beautiful. And, and so this passage goes on. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. And this is the gospel. The gospel literally means good news. So whenever you hear that your sins are forgiven, that life and salvation are yours, this is the good news. Now, they both are important, law and gospel. Uh, both need to be taught in tandem. Now, what if we only taught one side? What if at a church all we taught was the law? So you'd come in, and, and every Sunday you'd hear, this is what you are to do, this is what you are not to do. Oh, you didn't do it? This is what you deserve. All right, try harder, come back next week. That would be super depressing, right? No one would want to come to a church. But, but what if we only taught the gospel, which some are tempted to do? God loves you, he forgives you. God loves you, he forgives you. God loves you, forgives you. The problem with that is that you would never need an ongoing relationship with God. You'd never need to grow in your faith because God loves you, God forgives you. You'd never have to question your life of repentance or ever turn back to the Lord from sin. Um, God loves you and forgives you. So they work in tandem. Perhaps the best way of illustrating this is through COVID-19. Let's say someone found the cure for COVID-19. And you don't have the virus and they say, hey, um, do you want the cure? Here it is. And you're like, I'm good. I'm not sick. But now let's say you have contracted COVID-19 and you're not doing well. And someone comes along with the cure. Do you want it now? Absolutely. That's law and gospel. The law says you're sick. And if not taken care of, it'll lead to death. The gospel comes in and says you're cured because of Jesus Christ and what he's done for you. So how wonderful to have these main teachings of both law and gospel. Now, if you have any questions, feel free at any time to uh, join in and go from there. But now I want to talk a little bit about the accuracy and preservation of the Bible. And I remember going to seminary and... Uh, when I was at seminary, it was a time of the Da Vinci Code movie. Do you remember that movie? And it was a time where they thought maybe the church is hiding things from the people. Like maybe Jesus is married to Mary Magdalene, and, and, and maybe there are all these other secrets going on. And at that time, I was in this class called Textual Criticism. And what you did in this class is you compared various manuscripts of the New Testament to figure out the differences that are there. And, and, and I, I wasn't going to tell anyone this, but when I went into that class, I was hoping there were going to be so many juicy details. 
And I was going to be the ultimate whistleblower. I was going to tell everyone what the church was hiding because I finally had the tools to understand what is going on. So I go into this class looking for all the juicy details as I look for the variants in Scripture. As I compare manuscript and manuscript. And I got to tell you, one of the most boring classes I've ever been in. And it's not because I don't love the Word of God. It's just because there were no juicy details. (laughs) There was nothing really hidden. In fact, academically, less than 1% of the New Testament shows any variation or difference at all. In fact, if you want to know the major differences in the New Testament, uh, here they are. That people would mistake one letter for another. That they would skip lines. Because for a long time, the, the Bible was written by hand. And so just as you read and sometimes skip lines, so sometimes they would write and they'd skip down to another and so a manuscript would have something different. Or the ear led to hearing a different word than what was read. So sometimes when you were writing by hand, you had someone talking it to you. And so when someone would listen, they would use a cognate word as they were writing it instead of the actual word that was on the page before. Sometimes you would shorten longer sections, which if, again, you're writing by hand, you'd probably be tempted to do. Or your mind would substitute a synonym as you were reading along and you would just have the same phrase. So as I went into this class and I was studying all what I thought were going to be juicy details, I found that it rarely ever changed the meaning of the sentence, much less changed the whole meaning of the Bible. (laughs) We are saved by grace through faith. And this is tried and true and reliable. How wonderful. How awesome to know God had his handiwork in preserving what we have. But the interesting thing is, the people we meet apart from church, and and those that I've talked to, they don't believe this. I've had many conversations with people who want to throw out the Bible, and they said, well, haven't you heard of the gospel of Judas? And and don't you know it wasn't reliable? And I never mean to be snarky, but there's a part of me that says, have you done the research? Have you compared the manuscripts that are available? Have you read the other scriptures that didn't make the canon, uh, like the Didache and the Shepherd of Hermas and the different gospels? And I don't mean to be snarky, but I have. And I've found that God is trustworthy. He had his handiwork in preserving what we have. In fact, the best way of defending the Bible is the best way of defending a lion. That's what my seminary professor said. How do you defend a lion? You let the lion out of the cage and it defends itself pretty well. How do you offend the Bible and its inspiration? You read it, and it defends itself pretty well. So really, my big question to skeptics is this. When's the last time you read the Bible? I don't mean that to be unloving. I don't mean that to be snarky or holier than thou. I just genuinely mean when's the last time you opened Scripture and let God speak to you? Because those who have have found God, have found a renewed faith, have found truth that surpasses what everyone else is saying in our world. Get into the Bible and read it for yourself. In fact, if you're watching online, uh, one of the things we love to do as a church body is give away the Bibles. So if you chat in and, and you type your address, here's what I promise, that we will send you a Bible and you can dig in. I'll even give you notes on where to start and go from there. Another thing you can do is you can go to your phone and just search the Bible on the App Store. There's a great version called uh, the U version that gives different reading plans. Uh, it can read to you out loud. Uh, Finally, our Amazing Love app has a Bible option uh, that will read to you and be available for you. So um, with that, one of the the greatest things about faith is your personal devotion. In fact, when it comes to the strength of my faith, I have found um, it is stronger or weaker based on my personal devotion more than anything else. More than my worship life, more than communion attendance, based on my personal devotion 
That's where I see revival. That's where I see strengthening. All right. But more about the accuracy of the Bible, look at what Jesus said. Jesus said, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. So he again promised that this word was true. And um, more about uh, different uh, accuracy. Uh, I consider one of the stories is about the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, I had a chance to go to the uh, Middle East and uh, here in Jordan. This is the cave where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. And maybe some of you remember hearing about them. They were manuscripts that were older than anything we had. And so it was a time where people were saying, what are we going to find? Are we going to find the juicy details? And you know what they find? The same Bible. The same accurate word that has been preserved through the ages. In fact, on Amazon, if you want to buy a Dead Sea Scrolls version of the Bible, you can. But it's going to say the same thing as all the rest. God had his handiwork. I, I love that all the prophecies that were given thousands of years ago are fulfilled in Jesus as, as we saw. I, I think of um, David who wrote Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He, he wrote that uh, about 1,000 B.C. And, and that would be fulfilled 1,000 years later. Th that, that's incredible, right? I consider Isaiah who wrote around 500, pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. The punishment brought us peace was upon him. 500 years before it happened. How reliable is this word? Um, there are 5,000 manuscripts of the New Testament. That's pretty incredible. In fact, there are pieces of it all through different museums. Even the University of Illinois has some manuscripts of the New Testament. Um, and it's never been proved in proved wrong in history, geography, or science. Um, another thing about going to uh, Israel and the Jordan is they have all the archaeological digs. And dig after dig after dig, you have things that support what the Bible said. I didn't come across one that says, no, this is a complete contradiction. In fact, when I was there, they were um, uh, investigating David's city, where his palace used to be, and uncovering that. And they continue to find more and more that support the stories of the Bible. How awesome is this? Now, God again had a promise. He said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. What a great promise. So God has promised it will endure. Now, what is the purpose of the Bible? Why did he preserve it for us? Did he preserve it as a how-to for life? Well, not really. The Bible describes certain things like marriage and raising children and how to handle money and how to live, but it's not really the how-to to life. The major purpose of the Bible is that you would find the Messiah, Jesus, the Savior for sin and the answer for eternal life. In John chapter 20, it says, These are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you have, may have life in his name. Uh, 2 Timothy says, From infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus. So the major reason we use the Bible and look to it is so that we can have faith in a Savior from sin. So that we can know the peace of forgiveness, know that we have the right to be called children of God, and know that our true home is in heaven by God's side. Now this is different than, than what I thought about my seminary education. You know, when I went to seminary, I thought I'd come out and be the God answer man. You had a question about God, and I'd be like your tour guide. I know every angle, I know every facet of God, so you just ask me, and I'm going to tell you. I remember a seminary professor kind of blowing up this idea. He was saying, you know, to understand all there is about God, it's kind of like if you tried to drink Lake Michigan, a glass at a time. You have neither the time nor the capacity to do so. And so God will always be beyond us. He will always be that much higher and greater and wiser and more glorious. In fact, John, who said, these are written that you might believe, um, he, he, he said that, uh, that um, 
if, if we recorded everything about what Jesus did, there would be books upon books. And that's just Jesus' life of 33 years. And remember, again, the book of John, uh, about half of it is just about one week of his life. Uh, so, so this is not about knowing everything there is about Jesus or knowing everything there is about God. Now with that, I just had a question. Um, how can heaven pass away? That's a really, really great question. Um, when, when God said, you know, my word will endure, uh, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away, he was talking about this heaven and this earth. Uh, so again, uh, sometimes we refer to the sky as the heavens, and that's the context of what's meant. Because this heavens and this earth, this whole universe, does have an expiration date. An expiration date that only God will decide upon. Um, but he will destroy the current heavens and the current earth. But the great knowledge is that the new heavens and the new earth will never pass away. And that is a place that God is preparing right now for us to be. And so what we know is that we had a start date, but we will never have an end date. We will live forever with the Lord in a place too glorious to describe, where again, no mind is conceived, no eye is seen, no ear is heard, the wonder of what is in store. So Michelle, I hope that helps to answer this heavens and this earth, the sky, the universe, it will have an expiration date. Uh, but God is saying as long as it endures, uh, so will his word, uh, which is an awesome, awesome uh, reality. Now with that, the Bible's main purpose is to show us a Savior, but it does have another purpose. It does have other purposes. In First Peter 2, um, awesome, Michelle, uh, it says, Like newborn babies crave spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. Um, you may grow up. So God's goal is that you would continue to grow. And, and it reminds me of my life with kids. Um, when, when you first have an infant, you hope that they will continue to grow and progress, right? In fact, experience different foods. Uh, for a while, they might have for formula or be nursing, but then they get into that rice formula. I remember trying the rice formula and it being very bland. I had to try it before my child did. Um, but you hope they move on to greater things like a McDonald's hamburger, chicken McNuggets, to a Chipotle burrito, right? You hope they progress. And not only in, in what they're eating, but also in their wisdom, in, 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 in their bodies, in, in how they continue to experience life. God also desires for you to grow. Right now, you might be at a level where all you really know is that God loves you and saved you through Jesus. That's great. That's the milk. That's the nourishment that we need. But get into the rest. His goal for you is to chew on all of the word, to investigate all portions of what he's revealed, to, to even get into revelation uh, through commentary at, at a time, that you would continue to grow. Now, you might ask, well, What's the goal of having a strong faith? Well, I, I consider Jesus in the New Testament. When he was done teaching the Sermon on the Mount, he, he was talking about people who built a house, one on sand and one on rock. And, and the one on sand, when, when the winds and the storms came, it, it completely crashed because it had no firm foundation. But the one built on a rock, it stood firm. Now, now, what this was a picture of uh, is that we go through trials. And someone who has a very firm faith can be firm no matter what's going on. So I consider, you know, let's say this binder is my faith. I could hold it like this, and, and this could be me, you know, with a weak faith holding on to Jesus. But if a, a storm comes, or if there's an earthquake, or, or if someone, you know, hits me in the shoulder, it's very easy to drop this binder because it's a weak hold on my faith. But I could continue to grow. And now I could maybe hold the binder like this. Now here, if a storm comes or someone taps me on the shoulder, I'm more secure. There's less chance of, of falling from me. That through thick and thin, through COVID-19 and good times and bad times. No, see, see, I've, I've, I've investigated who God is. I know him. He's in my heart. No one's going to take him away. 
This is the goal of a firm faith, to hold strongly onto Jesus as Savior through all the storms that we go through. And it's also a reason why you should read your Bible. To continue to grow in the faith of God. Now, before we get into that, uh, another uh, thing that, that does happen is Psalm 119, what it says the Word can do. The Word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. And, and so what's really, really cool is that in a dark world, not knowing where we should go or what we should always do, the Word can illuminate a path. Uh, it can teach us how to love other people and what love looks like in a marriage, with children, with neighbors. Uh, it can definitely do that. It can teach us, you know, in, in a world of darkness, how to handle money. It can teach us what, what to spend our, our livelihood on or our time on. And, and, and that word will, again, illuminate different paths for us to, to follow. So how awesome is the word? Number one, to, to find our Savior Jesus there. Number two, to grow in, in strength and, and have a firm faith through all the storms. And number three, to, to be guided through this life as God will do. Now at this point, I need to ask you, how many of you are in a personal devotion? What I'd really recommend, again, is that if you want a revival of your faith, start reading your Bible. If you want a revival, pick up your Bible. But what I've also found is that unless you actually plan a time for it to happen, it doesn't happen on its own. It's kind of like going to the gym. If I make gym just an option, like, well, I, I might get there, I, I most likely won't. Where if I look at the gym or my exercise is a non-negotiable, it's just something that I do, it will happen, now I just need to plan it. So I know this is a different season, um, but I, I wanted to ask you, at what part of the day could it happen for you? Where could you spend time in the Word investigating God? That's a really, really good thing to consider. Because ultimately, again, I don't know if it will happen unless you plan time for it. Now, what also does it look like? I know that many people relate on different levels. Some people really love devotions. Some people like listening to the Word. Uh, some people like watching videos like our devotions online or your time of grace. Um, what I always recommend is try to chew on reading the Word um, you know, get to that point, persistent in doing that. Um, but understand that you're in a relationship with God. And so we're all going to relate differently with God. It reminds me of the difference between relating uh, with Bella and Nadia. On our daddy-daughter days, they look completely different. For Nadia, uh, she likes to go to Sky Zone and Panda Express. Um, that's, that's her fun. And so I go to Sky Zone and I jump around and I look really silly for a while. Uh, for Bella, she would never want to be at Sky Zone, and that's, that's totally cool. So for Bella, what we do is we have a fantastic meal. Uh, this, this last year, we went out to the, the Greek islands, and we watched a movie together. And, and Nadia would not dig sitting for two hours watching a movie, usually. Um, so we relate differently, even though I love them equally. I want you to know you're maybe going to relate to God differently than your spouse, than your friends, th than I do. And that's totally cool. But the big thing is to understand how you're going to relate to him. Whether it be, again, reading the Bible, listening to the Bible, watching videos. Uh, some also like to follow a schedule of reading. Some like to pick and choose where they go. Some like to journal. Um, so there are many different reading plans that are available for you. Um, also, I wanted to teach you about a journaling op option called SOAP. What it is to SOAP. Now, SOAP, I'm not referring to taking a shower, uh, but SOAP is an acronym that stands for Scripture, Observation, Application, and Prayer. So if I start with the S of SOAP, uh, what I could do is look at John 3.16. And so John 3.16, many know, is, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall have eternal life. Now, if I make an observation from John 3.16, um, one of them that I could make is this, that he loves the world. So I love that, that, you know, it's not just a certain type of people, socioeconomic status, a type of gender. He definitely loves everyone, the world. 
An application I could make then is that, um, you know, I want to love the world. If God loves the world, so I want to love everyone. Um, so, so I love the world as, as God does. Everyone is important. Everyone is valued. And then the prayer um, that I could have after I've uh, made that observation is uh, empower me to love the world as you do. So today, Lord Jesus, empower me to be like you in loving the world. And this would be your soap for the day on John 3.16. Now, there are other observations you could have made. Uh, you could have said, you know, uh, whoever believes. And so, you know, by believing I'm saved. Application, you know, Lord, thank you for faith and, and prayer. Help me to stay in that faith. Uh, many things you can do with soaping. Uh, but just one way of relating to God uh, through your daily devotions. Uh, is, is the SOAP acronym. Uh, but again, uh, what a wonderful opportunity uh, to read the Word. And, and I would just recommend, if, if you really want a revival right now, if you really want to dig into to God's Word, um, pick up your Bible and start reading. Now, just so you know, it's not too intimidating, and this is not a holier-than-thou statement. Um, my daughter, Bella, is in eighth grade, and, and she is a regular reader of the Bible. Uh, she's able to understand portions of the scripture, uh, take notes, and, and I continue to tell her it's the best thing she can possibly do. And I, I remember even at a young age, I remember in fourth grade reading through the book of Genesis. Um, I remember there were some questions I had, but there was still a lot that I could glean. And when my Bible reading really took off is when I was lonely. Uh, when God had removed kind of everyone else, uh, he reminded me that he's always there. And so when I picked up the Bible, I found a God who was there. Um, I, I loved reading Ecclesiastes, loved reading Proverbs, uh, the Psalms, and um, really been benefited by this practice through my life. So I hope you find benefit in it too. The final note that I will have just before we close is this, that there are different translations. And you can either have a more wooden translation, which is closer to the Greek, or a looser translation that is more colloquial language of today. What I've really found as a good translation is the NIV, uh, the New International Version. Also, our synod has a version called the EHV, which I really, really enjoy, the Evangelical Heritage Version. The one version that I really do not like is the New Living Translation. As a Bible scholar, I, I'm again not better, uh, but what I have found is that it does not make good Greek but it does seem to align with a certain camp's theology. And I gotta say, it even seems that they twist the Greek to make their theology fit instead of just letting the Greek and, and God's word be it. So I know it's a very popular version, um, but the NLT is one that I, I, I really do not recommend. Even if you've spent $40 on a beautiful Bible, pick up an NIV or a different version. And if you have more questions on that, uh, what I would do is use Bible Gateway and compare certain certain passages. Uh, compare Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. Compare Titus 3 on baptism. And you'll see some drastic differences in the translations. Well, that's all I got. If there are any other questions, feel free to, to put them online. But so awesome to talk about God's Word speaking to us. God who wants to talk to you daily. And you don't even need a pastor do it for you. You can pick up the, the living and active word and have this incredible relationship with God. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for preserving this powerful word for us. Please help us to use it in our lives as our relationship with you. Continue to pour out your Holy Spirit that gives us wisdom to understand and strengthen our faith so that through all the storms of life, COVID-19 or anything else that comes, we may stay firm in you and the knowledge of your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thanks for joining us. Uh, we will see you next week for our next lesson. God bless.